Good evening, everybody, and uh, a warm welcome to Mars. If this is your first time here, then, um, then welcome. Welcome to Canada's largest innovation center. Um, Mars is focused on building the next generation of technology companies. Um, if you've been to Mars before, then we're extremely glad to have you back. Tonight's panel is titled The Road to Smart Money, Practical Advice for Canadian Entrepreneurs Seeking Funding for Their Startup. I hope you are as thrilled as I am to be here, since I know tonight's discussion is going to be incredibly thought-provoking. Let me start by providing some context on how this panel came to be. By way of introduction, my name is Neha Kara, and I am currently part of the Mars Investment Accelerator Fund, and formerly part of the Mars Market Intelligence Team. Roughly six months ago, I found myself having some very interesting conversations with key folks in the Canadian VC industry. Conversations around the difficulties startups face with scaling their ventures and achieving success. Whether success comes in the form of an IPO, a successful acquisition, or global expansion and growth. So I set out on a mission, thinking, surely there must be something unique to the many Canadian companies that have been successful. And if we can uncover what these unique elements or secret sauce is, then it may help other Canadian startups as well. We turned our attention to companies involved in an acquisition and spent months analyzing thousands of data points and speaking to a number of entrepreneurs, VCs, and general industry experts. What we uncovered were three key facts about Canadian high-tech startups that have been acquired. First, the majority were acquired by U.S. companies. Second, the majority had raised money from U.S. investors. And third, a company's investors and end acquirer were most often located in the same region. I'm going to leave you with these thoughts and turn the discussion over to our panelists who have been invited down to help us better understand these findings and whether in their experience hold any merit. But first, I do want to take a moment to thank the speakers, each of whom traveled quite the distance to be here from Boston, Edmonton, Ottawa, Montreal, and Waterloo. So thank you each for taking the time out of your incredi incredibly busy schedules to be a part of tonight's discussion. I would also like to thank the CVCA, who was instrumental in developing the themes being presented tonight and that were presented in the Borderless Investments Report. Now let me introduce the moderator of tonight's panel, Stephen Hurwitz. Stephen is a partner at the Boston-based law firm Choate, and one of his specialties is looking at Canada-US cross-border transactions. Stephen has written many publications and spoken at many major conferences regarding the technology and venture capital industries in Canada. He is regarded as a thought leader on promoting commercialization and foreign investment in Canada and on advancing Canada's VC industry. Stephen? Over to you. Thank you very much, Neha. It's my great pleasure to welcome all of you to our panel, The Road to Smart Money, Practical Advice for Canadian Entrepreneurs Seeking Funding for Their Startup. I can think of no panel better qualified to guide us down that road or give us that practical advice than the one before you. They bring to this task deep expertise and experience in both the worlds of venture capital and of entrepreneurship, and in a moment they'll introduce themselves. The inspiration for this panel is a wonderful paper, and Neha alluded to it already, by Mars' own Neha Kira, entitled Borderless Investments, Practical Funding Advice for Canadian Startups. Her paper includes, among many other important points, an insightful empirical analysis of reasons why companies should seek potential investors located in their largest target market area as a way to optimize their future business success and exits. For those of you who haven't read her paper, I highly recommend it. And on your tables, you'll find information on how to access it. In addition to discussing issues raised by that paper, 
We'll also offer practical tips for identifying the right VC for your company and how to get its attention and obtain a hearing, as well as the do's and don'ts of presenting to it. Our panelists will also discuss ideas for strengthening the Canadian VC industry, as well as share their views as to the hottest segments for VC investors in the remainder of 2013 and 2014, and where the most exciting exit opportunities will be found. And we'll try to do all of this in about 45 minutes, leaving about 15 minutes at the end for your questions. So let's get started with some brief self-introductions. I've already been introduced, uh, so why don't we start, Chris, with you. Hi, uh, my name is Chris Arsno. I'm managing partner with Inovia Capital, a venture capital fund, 100% focus on IT, uh, with offices in Montreal, New York, uh, Calgary, and now Toronto, where we do basically seed and early stage. Therefore, we'll invest pre-money and put in a few hundred K, as well as our sweet spot, which is a few million dollars per round. Uh, of financing and over the life of a company will be anywhere between five and ten million dollars in. We have uh, about two-thirds of our portfolio in Canada and about a third in the US, ma mainly New York and California. David? Uh, hey, I'm, so I'm David Quayle. Uh, my current company is um, based out of Edmonton, basically splitting time between Edmonton and San Francisco, trying to get the best of both worlds. Um, Previous company to that was called Atasa. We sold that to you, send it. Um, and prior to that, I was helping, uh, I was leading mobile product for a Y Combinator company, um, which sold to Motorola, uh, which obviously became Google. Um, that's the quick and dirty of me. Code? My name is Code Cubit. I'm the managing partner of Mistral Venture Partners, a uh, newly minted VC firm based in Ottawa. Uh, we're a $35 million early stage fund. Uh, specifically focused on IT uh, in Canada and the U.S. With uh, the target is 80% of our deals will be in Canada and 20% in the U.S. Carol, Carol Lehman is my name. I'm the CEO of a Waterloo-based early-stage tech startup called Exonify. We're a gamified e-learning platform that combines game mechanics and brain science to drive corporate knowledge retention. Uh, this is my fourth company. I sold the last one to Google two years ago and then basically picked up the IP for this company from a couple of the original founders and have raised for this one $5 million of venture capital uh, from a little bit from the IAF here in Toronto and the rest from two US VCs. Great. The way we're going to proceed is we have five questions. Some of them are multi-part. And in each instance, we'll start with a first responder whom I'll pick, and then we'll ask the entire panel to chime in. Debates, disagreements, all welcome. We'll start with code. The biggest gripe I think Canadian entrepreneurs have with, Canadian, with the Canadian high-tech industry is around the lack of venture capital. How important is it in their search for financing that companies look at investors beyond those in their native regions? And how important is it that companies seek to get closer to their largest end markets by including well-positioned investors in those end markets right from the start? Does it work? So the way I'll answer the question is to tell you a little bit about why I'm here. I've spent the last 15 years uh, living in the US, so I am Canadian but I spent uh, my US time in, in, on two coasts, in California and in Washington, DC. Uh, I've been at three different venture firms, uh, one Siena Ventures, uh, I was at Gabriel Venture Partners, and then I was at Motorola Ventures, where I ran their West Coast office in California. I, um, in 2008, left the venture world to start, uh, or to run one of my portfolio companies, uh, then uh, sold that to another company and took a sabbatical for a year. And while I was on sabbatical in Europe, I got a call from a guy in Ottawa who said, hey, we'd heard your name in the Valley. Uh, what would you think about coming back to Canada to start a venture capital fund? And so long story short, I, I did do that. But before we, we built the fund, we, we looked pretty long and hard at some of the, the economics around uh, venture capital in Canada as it relates to the US and our experience. And we tried to structure a fund that 
that made sense given the dynamics. Now the, the, the statistics are pretty clear. Um, the US I think is on, on a typical clip of about 30, 32 billion dollars a year spent in venture. Canada is about 1 20th of that, 1.5, 1.8. I think that's on the rise, but it's not the typical one to 10 that you think of when you think of Canada, US. Um, for me, that spelled opportunity. Uh, I, 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 you know, I am Canadian, I know lots of Canadians, I know there's a lot of technical talent here, there's a lot of promising ideas and companies. Uh, and when there's a disparity like that, a mismatch, it, it's an opportunity, it's an arbitrage opportunity, which is what got me excited in the first place. During the course of uh, several months when we, we were crafting the strategy of the fund, we looked at the statistics. And one statistic stood out above all of the others, and that is the following. Less than 10% of Canadian companies get US capital, but fully 33% of the exits and 45% of the profits go to those 10%. So what you can debate the numbers, but I think it's, it's fairly intuitive, and we would all agree that there is a headwind. And the, the answer is simply that you need to look beyond the border. And, and what I tell companies is, you know, imagine that line is not there. It, it, you know, there are two different countries sort of on the geopolitical scope, but in terms of capital and talent and customers, that line is quite blurry. Um, there's no more impediments for US VCs to invest in Canada from a, a, a sort of accounting perspective. Um, there's plenty of exits up here and plenty of precedents to attract them to come back. So um, the, the thing we did on the fund to structure it to, to take advantage of that anomaly is we have two partners uh, living in California, two guys I've known for a long time, and I have another partner in Ottawa. And what we do is we invest a little bit of money in a company up front, and then if and only if we're able to attract a US syndicate partner to the deal, will we invest material capital. So the point I'm trying to get to is, uh, yes, you have to go south. The dollars are bigger. You just accept that. Um, but I wouldn't see it as an impediment. I'd see it as just a, another place to do business. Whether you're flying to Montreal or you're flying to Boston, it's effectively the same thing. Chris, how do, how do you feel about that philosophy as a VC? I, I, I think that we can build very large companies here and we don't need a U.S. investor, even though a vast majority of our deals have U.S. investors in the deals. And, you know, Radian 6, $350 million, there was no U.S. investors in it, right? But what they did have is a management team that was in the customer's face. So when you're talking about entrepreneurs going beyond the, bar the border, my problem is that we're still talking about the border. I would say that there isn't any border, like, you know, we have to stop talking about it because it doesn't exist. You have a company, you go where your customers are. And to your st statistics, which I think are very valid, one thing that we have to note, note is that the US market is the buying market. They still represent a third of the world uh, uh, buying power, power, right? So we are selling to Americans. Therefore, if you're not building a company that is attractive or have relationships with Americans, then you won't necessarily be si selling to them. Therefore, you'll be selling to somebody else at a lower point. So I agree with certain of your, your points, but I do think that we just have to stop thinking about the border and you go where your customers are, you go where your investors are, you go where your providers are, and you build those relationships. It's, it's part that, and it's it's also just that it's, I mean, I say this over and over, it's kind of the law of numbers. Like, especially when you're seeking an investment, you just have to find the best fit. Um, so people that believe in the vision, you have, to, you have to find those people and it's hard to find, especially when, you know, in Canada, you just don't have that number of, of investors. And so it just takes like talking to many. And so the question of like, whether you should seek outside investment, it's like, it's a weird way to like think of the problem. It's like, you should seek the best, smartest capital you can find. And there's no border. Like it doesn't matter if that if the person happens to be in Ottawa or Toronto or San Francisco. You just got to go where there's a fit. Well, well returning to, to to the question for for, um, is there a special advantage a Canadian company would have if its market is in a particular part of the U.S. if it has a U.S. investor in that market who knows it well. Or should they really be focusing, as, as, as you're indicating, David, more on what, what's the fit? 
um, and, and, and other, other kinds of issues? I mean, I think it's a balance. I think that there's like absolutely an advantage to being, to having, I mean, there's two sides of it, right? There's like where are your customers and where's your investor? And like obviously if your investor is in bed with the community that the, the market is in, then that's a natural fit. But like where's the market of consumer tech? It's not San Francisco. Like if you're defining your, your market as San Francisco, you're kind of screwed. Um, so it's like if I'm building a consumer startup, like I guess some of the big players and some of the acquisition targets and some of the influencers are in San Francisco, but for that type of business, it doesn't matter so much. Mm -hmm. If you're building a SaaS company, then, then maybe it does more. Um, so it's obviously a balance. I'm giving a wishy-washy answer here, but I would optimize towards like finding a fit um, and f someone that's going to fight for you because that's really what it's about. And, and don't forget, like an entrepreneur, when they're starting a business or even when they're building their business, the one thing they have as, as power, they have the power of choice. They choose their investors, they choose their employees, they choose their co-founders. I don't believe the crap of saying that, no, this is the best I could do. If it's the best that you could do, maybe you should be doing something else. You have to go and get those that you need. So if you need these type of employees, you go get them. If you can't convince them, then you have another problem and maybe you shouldn't be doing that job either. But at the end of the day, you, you, you deserve the, not the effort that you put in, but the smarts that you put in. So that goes for closing your, your investors. Carol, any thoughts? I can say from my own personal experience, um, I have had vastly different experiences with Canadian VCs and US VCs. Now it's changing. So over the last 12 or 15 years and four companies, I've raised well more than $100 million in venture capital, private <coughs> equity, angel capital, debt, you name it. Every form of capital you could raise, I'm done for those companies. And, um, and my personal experience is that, and as I say, it is changing, but uh, up until recent years, Canadian VCs, private equity, knew nobody, like nobody. And I, I can tell you that um, the number of times that I asked my investors for connections to people, for introductions, uh, for assistance with a variety of things that would further the business and help accelerate it. Um, you know, the number of responses I got with tangible help were, you know, less than what I could count on one hand. My experience with US VCs is that they network like nothing else and they know everybody. And uh, I can ask, do you know this person? And um, literally within a matter of hours, I could be speaking to that individual on the phone. So that has been my experience, my personal experience, uh, in terms of the ability to accelerate your business product in your market. I have had vastly different experiences simply because of the way um, US VCs network, know each other, uh, are just voracious um, connectors. Mm -hmm. And as I say, it's changing. I've, I've noticed a, um, a very measurable change over the last three or four years in the Canadian VC realm. And that is because borders are coming down. There is much more of a mix uh, and flow. And, and that's a really good thing for Canadian entrepreneurs. Um, Canadian VCs are getting much better connected to the US market and the markets in which you, you want to sell. Sticking with that theme, and taking it one more step, how important is it for a Canadian company to have a US VC investor in its syndicate for optimizing exit opportunities? We've just focused on commercial opportunities. What about the end exit, the M&A, the road to the underwriters, and all of that? Do you want to answer that in the first instance? Once again, it's the same answer for me. Um, I can tell you, Xonify is, is very early stage, you know, we're a year and three months old, and, uh, and already I can identify 10 potential acquirers for us, no intention of selling the company anytime soon, but uh, 10 potential acquirers, um, I have, you know, folks on my advisory board like LinkedIn people, ex-Zynga people, I'm um, connected to Salesforce, Oracle, all of the various categories of potential acquire for my product. And that would not have come about as rapidly as it has without my US VCs. David? Yeah, I mean, I'll probably contradict myself here, but. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's that's perfectly welcome. The second time I've talked and I'm already contradicting myself. 
Um, but our acquisition was, um, we had a couple acquisition offers and both of them were largely inf influenced through our investors who were, who were American, they were Valley investors. Um, and I kind of like, this is a terrible cliche, so but bear with me, but <laughs> I view the whole like M&A and acquisition space as it's one big giant game of hot potato where instead of potatoes, people are passing around these big bags of money. And instead of like just passing it on, sometimes you pluck some money out. It's this big game of like money flowing. And that game is being played in the Valley largely. And so like I want as many players on my team in that game. And so like one easy way to do that is to have your investors there because they know the game, they know the other players, they know all the rules. And so for me, it's, it's you know, I said, you, you gotta optimize on fit, but um, having people that know that game, and it's not like you can't just, you know, drop into it, but it's, it's a little easier when you're there, just because you know, you know the game. I'll, I'll make a comment. I think Carol makes a good point, which is, you know, USVCs network like crazy. I think the, my experience in the Valley is, there's events like this each and every day, and yeah. there's probably four or five each and every day. <coughs> and uh, the years that I lived there, I was out five days a week at events like this every week. I mean, I literally nearly got a divorce. And I can tell you there's a lot of partners at firms <laughs> who are divorced for that reason. And what it boils down to is that it's simply a numbers game. And uh, it's a numbers game for finding funding, right? So you need to talk to 100 VCs to get one to bite. You need to, mm -hmm. you need to be hanging out at the cocktail hours. You need to be in the conversation and a lot of conversations for someone to come in and acquire you. And so being, having a presence outside of Canada, can't look, Canada is a small market. It's, it's unique and it's interesting, but it's still small. New York, San Francisco, Boston, for example, uh, when you go to a lot of events like this, eventually the word gets out and you become the hot potato, you become the, 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 the company du jour, and the odds of you getting picked up are that much higher, simply by the numbers. And like to add to that, a lot of, I mean, there's events like this, but then there's also just serendipitous moments. And again, like using our company as an example, it was, it was uh, our advisor who came through us through our investor was just out having coffee um, with the CTO of You Send It. And they were talking products and it was like, hey, like, what do you think about this company I'm advising? And that happened like three or four times where I mean, ultimately it was ended in an acquisition, but that happened like several times, which led to business development. And so it's just those, it's, it's meetings like this, but even more importantly, like the coffee shop, the just casual conversation. And Canada won't ever have that type of... We just don't have the scale. We don't. Yeah. So we have to build those relationships or have activities in the U.S. Or if your market is the U.S., right? If you want to sell, if you think your buyer of your company or your big partner is in Europe, I mean, like, you don't care about the U.S. investor. You're going to focus on an investor that has the relationships. But what everybody's saying is all about relationships. We're a little Canadian fund, but we still have one exit to Yahoo, one exit to Google, one exit to Disney, one exit to Nielsen, one exit to Airbnb. I mean, it's not that bad for a little Canadian fund, right? But we are in the US every week. I have a partner in New York. Uh, so it's all about building the relationship where it matters, both for M&A, for investors, as well as customers. There's a VC in Boston who every year takes a road trip. And he goes to visit the giant technology companies, more specifically their heads of acquisition. I say, why, why, do you, why are you doing that every year? He said, because I have companies which six, seven, five years from now may be sold to them. And I want to start talking to these guys now about them so they can follow the companies. And so that's one example of a culture which says you start to sell the company the day you <laughs> invest in the company. Well, now that we understand all these issues, um, let's get to some nuts and bolts questions which are really important for startup companies. And we'll start with Carol. This is a multi-part question. People should, on the panel should feel free to answer any of the questions, all of the questions, none of the questions. How should Canadian companies go about selecting and targeting the right USVC, and we've already touched on that a little bit, but this may get now a little more granular in terms of the nuts and bolts tactics. What tips do you have for getting the attention of US or Canadian VCs and then a hearing? Knowing that these guys will get five or 600 business plans a year, they may focus on 10% of them, 
they may f invest in one, two, or three percent of them a year. Once a company obtains a hearing, how do you differentiate yourself and stand out from the rest? And can you give us some examples of good or bad presentations you've seen and offer some do and don't rules of thumb for presenters? Are there differences in approaches when seeking funding from Canadian and US VCs? And it looks like we've, that's a barrage of a lot of questions. They've, <laughs> they've seen all the questions before. So um, we, we can start on that one um, with Carol. OK, so part one, how should Canadian companies go about selecting and targeting the right US VC? Um, I think there's a number of factors that you need to consider. What size of round are you looking to raise? Um, you know, so you're in sort of seed stage or stage A, B, growth, you know, that kind of stuff, because they can be segmented into uh, the different styles of deal that they do. Um, I've had many VCs say to me over the years they will not invest in a portfolio company that has, a, or uh, invest in a company where they have a direct competitor already in their portfolio. So a lot of people, a lot of the early stage entrepreneurs I talk to are looking for VCs who have investments in similar companies, thinking that, well, they get the space. And there is some validity to that, but they don't want direct competitors. So do your research mm -hmm. and understand <coughs> what types of companies they invest in, at what stage they go in. Um, in terms of getting a hearing with them and how do you get in front of them, Again, I've had many VCs say to me, they do take the rare cold call, and I mean, these guys can tell you, you know, from the horse's mouths how they do it, but um, I have never had luck getting in front of a, a VC and getting a real hearing just with a cold call um, or sending an email. Um, introduction, warm introduction, always is the best way to go. If you if they have a portfolio company that you're connected to in some way that can make an introduction for you, those are always the fastest, easiest ways to go in with some level of credibility. So um, I would suggest you try to do that. You use LinkedIn, you know, it's your best friend, see who you're connected to, who they're connected to in some target VCs, and, uh, and perhaps try to work your network that way. And um, one comment I'd have on that, one very prominent USVC said that in 25 years he has never taken a single cold call. It's yeah. not worth it. Yeah. So someone asked him, well, uh, how does someone get an introduction? He said, if someone cannot get a personal introduction to me through the internet, they are mm -hmm. not going to be a successful business person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so they'll just assume somehow someone who's making a cold call just yeah. isn't, isn't really thinking about how, to, how, how you go about the, this culture. Mm -hmm. and, and, and their thinking is, if you don't understand my VC culture, you probably don't understand your customer's culture. Mm -hmm. And I would also say, do not just email a business plan. Nobody emails a business plan anymore. Um, that will definitely not get you funded. Um, you know, so try the warm introduction route. Uh, that's the best way to go. In terms of how to present yourself, um, I had an experience last year when we just got Exonify going where I was invited to pitch the company at uh, Fortune Magazine's Brainstorm Tech Conference in Aspen. They do a big uh, tech conference every year. And uh, so I was one of five companies competing. It was a four minute pitch which is very, you know, it's, that's not quite as short as you get with a VC, but you get a very short period of time with which to convey your product, your market, your team, you know, the key elements of what should be in your pitch. And uh, this is not a, a lie. I, I got there just before the lights went up on the production. It was filmed and, you know, on the internet and the whole thing. Um, it was like American Idol, um, three VC judges, voting by audience text on the internet and the whole thing. And uh, I had been rerouted through Los Angeles. I didn't sleep all night. I screamed in there like five minutes before the thing. The other contestants thought I wasn't going to make it. And I got up there and banged it out and won. And why did I win is because I stuck to the script. There are, it is not rocket science in terms of what you need to say and how you need to say it. And there are many, many, many examples of pitches that you should 
take very close looks at. Don't recite the gross history of your company from beginning to end in your pitch and get into deep detail. Um, I would suggest, you know, if you want to go on and watch those brainstorm tech pitches, they're on the Fortune site, uh, you'll see the very common mistakes the other contestants made when they got up and did their four minute pitches as compared to the pitch I did. Mine was very simple and it conveyed those key elements without needing to get into lots of you know, depth. And, and to the extent that you, you do get more time in your pitch with a VC, but keep it to those core things and look at lots of examples pitch to other people, practice. Um, don't be too rehearsed, you know, you need to know your stuff, but uh, um, you know, don't go in, don't prepare something and not get anybody to look at it and ignore all of the resources out there that will help you do a really bang up job of it. You can do it, it's just a matter of being smart about how you do it. I love your example. That, that's a great story because even us, when we fundraise, we're also pitching. And our best pitches, we didn't practice the day of the pitch, but uh, we were in New York for our last round and we're meeting with a few LPs and we practiced, we pitched 20 times. Yep. 20 times, we're, there's dynamic, right? We're multiple partners pitching and adding and going. 20 times in front of different audiences before going to pitch to our, our main LP. So one trick or one tip uh, is that when you're preparing your pitch, even for your first few investor meeting, try to pitch the first time around to an investor that you don't really care if he actually invests or not, because it's gonna, it's gonna help you. It's gonna help you, you know, form your ideas better and have a better line of communication. But practice, yes, 100%. So I'll add um, one, of the, one of the secrets of venture capital. So here's where you get your money's worth. So the, the, the currency of venture capital is deal flow. And that's that's what we deal that's what we deal in with each other. That's what we deal with in M um, and A guys and corp dev guys and other VCs and service providers. It's all deal flow. So I trade off deals constantly, um, and then by the very nature, there's a there's a stratification of quality of deals, and there's good deals and there's bad deals and there's crazy deals and there's amazing deals. And our job, or what I aspire to, to get to is that sort of the very top layer of the, the best deals. And like, I don't, this, I don't know how PC I can be or can't be, but like beautiful women, everybody wants them, but they're really hard to get to. So you, the way you do that is you get sources of deal flow that are trusted and reliable. Um, and the way you as entrepreneurs do that is you talk to your lawyers and your accountants and your uh, executive friends when I get an email from a CEO who I've funded in the past, I'm going to look at that email. If I get an email from a lawyer who I trust or a big name law firm, I'm going to look at that email. And I'm going to, and I call it VIP treatment, but the better the source that comes to me with that introduction, the better, the more time I'm going to give it because irrespective of that particular deal, I want that relationship. So that's, that's a piece of advice. The second thing on the, on the, on the pitches, I'll give 10 seconds. My advice is, Tell the problem on the first slide and tell how you're going to solve it on the second slide. And just cut to the chase. And, and I have a very short attention span, so this may not be everybody, but the fact of the matter is we literally see hundreds of deals. And there's one year, I think we counted up as a firm, we saw 3,000 deals, four partners. And saw is you know, a relative term, but the fact is we see deals all the time. That's what we do. It's what we enjoy doing, frankly. I love meeting with entrepreneurs. But the, the point is that within 30 seconds, maybe even 15 seconds, I know probably as much about your business as you do. And I'm not trying to be glib. I'm just saying that I see business plans all the time. So if you can get my attention really, really quickly, then I'm going to put more effort into it. And that's the subtlety. That's where you need to spend your time is get that hook. I want to build on what Carol said, never send a business plan. And what you said, cut to the chase. In addition to getting a personal introduction, you need a one or two page executive summary, not longer. And some VCs tell me they will not read past the first two paragraphs. They can tell, this is your point, they can tell. So what should this executive summary say in the first couple of paragraphs? Here's my take, following up on what Code said. 
and you've heard this before, that your company has disruptive proprietary technology that solves a major problem in a vast, rapidly growing, addressable global market. Don't go on and on about the market. They know the market better than you do. A quick word about the meaning of disruptive. Darwin said that success goes not to the strongest or even to the most intelligent, but to those adapt. With all due respect to Mr. Darwin, he got it wrong when it comes to VCs and technology. Rather, it was George Bernard Shaw who got it right when he said, the reasonable man adapts himself to the world, or woman. The unreasonable man adapts the world to himself. Therefore, all progress depends on the unreasonable man. Top tier VCs seek to invest in, not in companies that adapt to the game, but in those that change it. Not in companies whose products are nice to have, but must have. Not in products that improve upon those in, in the market, but hopefully replace them and change the way business is done. Not in products that adjust to an existing market, but sometimes create a new one and are the first entrant into it. Uh, as in the words of Wayne Gretzky, top VCs want to invest in companies that are focused not on where the hockey puck has been, but on where it's going. Over and over, I see Canadian companies make a mistake. They say, I've got a great market, it's 150 million. That's not a great market. It needs to be 500 million, hopefully a billion. 150 million can be a great market if you own 100% of it, and some big player can combine your product with its, and two plus two equals 50. And so sometimes there are exceptions to all of these um, issues. Um, they're looking, and you've heard the model of US VCs. Uh, 10 companies are invested in, they try to find Grand Slam home runs, five of them go bankrupt, a few models, some do well, and there's one Grand Slam home run. If your projections five, seven, eight, nine years out aren't showing a return of 10, and this is a rule, th there are exceptions all over the place. Um, something's wrong, uh, maybe you're not asking for enough capital, or maybe you're not a, 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 a good candidate. One thing that USVCs see happen is that Canadian companies often do not ask for enough money. And yes, you can create an IT company very cheaply, open source software, the cloud, internet tools, internet distribution, but 2012, Canadian companies had 44% of the capital of their direct competitor. First quarter 2013, 49% of the capital. You can't address a large market on a half a tank of gas. There is a stronger cultural aversion in Canada to dilution than there is in the US. The view in the US is more take the money and run. In Canada is, oh my god, I'm going from 30% to 28%. Um, the other reasons there the less money may be asked for is I think labor costs are lower here. Some Canadian companies are very efficient. And they're also influenced by the behavior of some Canadian VCs who historically have done spray and pray, um, investing in a lot of companies, very small amounts of money. Um, it is critical that you knowledgeably and candidly discuss the risk of your product and market. One CEO explained to USVC why it had a 30% chance of succeeding, but if it did, it would be a game change. That was an investment. VCs are prepared to take risk. What they are not prepared to do is to explain to you the risks of your company that you should have been explaining to them. In those first two paragraphs, a lot to put in two paragraphs, any patents, patents pending should be mentioned. They evidence your R&D is resulting in serious ideas that have value and are unique and protectable and may give a sustainable uh, competitive advantage. Where US VCs and Canadian ones have been burned over and over and over is investing in world-class technology and the managers had no idea how to practically and profitably commercialize it. Any de-risking you can do of product development and customer adoption shows that you may be on that road, or directors or investors who are well known, but especially customers who are well known. And last point, in the aftermath of the recession and in the face of continuing uncertainties, there are many US VCs who are especially focused on investing in capital efficient companies with well controlled burn rates and products that save customers time and money with rapid payback and a clear path to self-sustaining and self-financing profitability. So the first paragraph or two of your executive summary may be the hardest you'll ever write, um, but they are absolutely the most important. You will probably not get a second chance to make a first impression. And it reminds me, and then I'll, I'll stop, 
of a famous author who wrote a letter to his son. It was 12 pages long. And at the end of the letter, the author said, son, I apologize for this long letter. I just didn't have enough time to write you a short one. If you ask what the takeaway of the executive summary is of all these points, that your company has the potential to be a future global industry leader. So to summarize Steve's, Steve's <laughs> comment, like he would have done that pitch, we would not have invested. Right? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I want to hear. It's not, but it's about execution and about the way that you go at it. I mean, at the end of the day, the paragraphs or not, when you present yourself in front of an investor and you were warmly walked into that meeting by another CEO that the investor already has a trust relationship with, guess what? You just went up one notch. And when you're talking about what you're trying to address and why you need the type of money that you're going after, be it a small amount or a large amount, then you just went up another notch. It's, it's a question of you're building up a relationship with somebody that's going to get married with you with multi-million dollars. So don't take it lightly and you know, do your homework and make sure that when you're walking into that meeting, you're doing things right at the end of the day. Let's shift to a macro question. And I'm going to come right back to Chris. How is cross-border investing affecting the overall health of Canada's high-tech and VC industry, whether positive or negative. And related to that, how significant will the impact be on the Canadian VC industry of the new $400 million VC action plan in the 2013 federal budget? And are there other new steps that the government should be thinking about to reinvigorate the Canadian VC industry? It's funny, yeah. every time we talk about VC in Canada, there's always a word government that comes somewhere. <laughs> so, um, and uh, actually our friend here uh, had a few interesting blogs over the last uh, few weeks on Tech Vibes, if you want to look him up. Um, caused quite a stir also, one of them. So, in terms of, uh, of U.S. investors, I mean, like, at the end of the day, be it the U.S. investors or whatever investors that are bringing relationships, contacts, and everything else, it's always good. It's always good. Uh, the difference maybe today and 10 years ago is that Accel, top tier, tier one VC, based in California, open uh, offices in New York, they don't even have a partner in New York. They have offices there in order to have a space, but they don't even have, like, the partners are all in the valley. They've raised a few billion dollars up until now, very successful. We, they came into a few of our deals. They also came into a deal in Montreal, and when they came into the deal in Montreal, they had identified that opportunity in that space, and that entrepreneur stuck out, so they went after him. First meeting, he didn't even respond, even, even call back. Second meeting, it started being interest. Third meeting, he Googled Excel. Oh, OK. Maybe I should be talking to them, right? Uh, at the end of the day, we're not part of that deal, even though we're very close and it's on, in our own backyard. Uh, the reason why is that Excel started to get to know the team, the entrepreneur, the space even more. And their $20 million term sheet became 25, became a $30 million term sheet. And for the entrepreneur, he didn't need all of that money, but he had different plans to scale and build the big businesses. I'm actually doing a, a fireside chat with him in Montreal next week at uh, Accelerate Montreal, and I'm looking forward to it because he's building a big company. But Excel did the deal by themselves. So the difference with a few years, a few years ago and today is that there isn't any borders. So the US investors, they find an entrepreneur, they find an opportunity, you build a relationship with it. They don't need a local investor to co-invest with. They'll just do the deal because it's a great deal. So just you know, make sure that what you're offering is something great. Uh, in terms of the government implication and uh, your, your, the, your second question, Steve, uh, we are lucky in Canada uh, to actually have governments, both provincial and federal, that actually care about about this class because I've been knocking at many corporate doors in Canada and across Canada. Corporate Canada doesn't necessarily care about this class of, of investment, about building the relationships with VC funds because they see VC funds building portfolios of companies that are overvalued for what they would pay as potential acquisitions. It's not about that, guys. It's about 
understanding what's coming ahead of the curve, understanding what's a threat and what's an opportunity. It's about building relationships, building channels, being the first one to offer through your, the, the big corporation's existing channels a new product that gives them an edge on somebody else. It's about those relationships. The US, you know, you have to give it to them, they build relationships. They're born to get, build relationships. And on that front here, we're still a bit shy. You know, we think that we have something hot. You know, we just go in our corner and we like, we all get all excited. Now, in the US, it's the other way around. They share, they share. So I think it's good and I think it's great that our, our, our governments actually care about the class, but not like it was back in the mid 90s or early 2000s. They don't want to get in the way. So that $400 million uh, commitment is part of your taxes. So by the way, a, a piece of your taxes is going to go into venture capital. And the way that is going into venture capital is that the federal government, they put it into their last budget, they basically said, hey, there's $400 million here. We want to put this money at work in private funds ma managed by private individuals that are looking at private companies that are, have the ability to attract additional capital, and we're going to piggyback. So that $400 million is coming back to everybody as a 800 or 1.2 billion or hopefully even more in terms of returns. So they're coming into funds such as Inovia or others on the same terms and conditions as any other fund. So I think that's good because they actually become a catalyst. Uh, sadly, at the same time right now, there's also a labor-sponsored uh, issue where the government is putting more money in the, in, the, in the new VC $400 million fund, but at the same time are reducing their commitments in the labor sponsorship side of funds. And uh, there's a big component of cash that goes into VC through that part. So I think there's still a lot of communications that need to, to flow. And, but the issues are addressable. So uh, for that, I'm, I'm kind of happy because in, in the US right now, my, la my last point here, uh, people think it's tough in Canada. Steve was saying, oh, 600 deals. No, no. We get, uh, last year we got over 700 deals. Most, I won't say all, because it's almost not all. There's, I think there's one, one and a half deal. Most of our deals came from our other CEOs or our co-investors. The introductions were all from our co-investors or our existing CEOs. Uh, we have angel investors or our, our CEOs co-investing with us in other deals, right? So, and we saw 700. Excel is over 7,000. They did the same number of deals as us last year. Um, some of the panel will, will be remaining so that you can talk with them after we uh, adjourn. But I want to take this opportunity to thank our wonderful panelists, Chris, David, Code, Carol. I want to thank our partner, the Canadian Venture Capital and Private Equity Association, which was extremely helpful in all of this. I want to thank Neha for all the work she did to make this possible, as well as her many wonderful colleagues here at Mars. And I especially want to thank all of you for joining us this evening. Thank you.